That's Bobby Rydell with his 1959 hit Kissin' Time on the Cameo label. And our guest today is author James Rosen, who's just released a brand new book called Philly Pop Rock Rhythm and Blues, a look back at the musical history of Philadelphia. Mr. Rosen has written books on, oh, a variety of subjects, so some music books, a lot of TV books, and, uh, well, he kind of covers it all in this uh, in this brand new edition. Uh, James, welcome to the show, and, uh, yeah, well, you cover pretty much the entire spectrum of uh, Philly music. Yeah, I, I cover, I, the book covers the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I have commentary from a lot of the artists uh, that uh, recorded in, the, in that era. Uh, the early, uh, or I should say, the golden years of rock and roll, the doo-wop era, and then later on the uh, rhythm and blues era of the uh, mid to late 60s, 70s, early 80s. Would I be correct in assuming the Philly sound, well, certainly the Cameo Parkway stuff, begins with Bernie Lowe and Cal Mann? Yeah, they started in, in 1957 with Charlie Gracie. Yeah. And uh, the Cameo Parkway era was 1957 to 1967. And they basically started out as songwriters. Well, yeah, Bernie Lowe was a musician. He was a piano player. He played on some of the TV shows here, and then he uh, performed at some of the hotels, you know, when they had bands, and people would come and have dinner and, and dance in hotels and places of that ilk in the early 50s, mid-50s. And then he, uh, he started Cameo Records, which later became Cameo Parkway, Right, and he started with uh, Charlie, who had the the, the monster hit Butterfly sure. and, and Fabulous, and then he uh, his next big recording artist was Bobby Rydell. Yep, and then he had uh, Chubby Checker and uh, Dee Dee Sharp, and the or the 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 Dovells, the Times, the Orlons, and then they recorded some other artists that had been very popular in the fifties in Philadelphia and other labels like Lee Andrews and. Lee Andrews, I should say, in the hearts. And and then uh, they pretty much were affected by the British invasion, and they sold uh, the company in the mid-'60s, and then the new owners closed the door in 1967. And now it's owned by that same person, or his son, uh, their Abco Records in New York City. No, I mean, there were there were other labels here, too. You know, there right. was Jamie Guyton, and there was Swan Records. Right. You know, they had... Uh, some successful artists in those labels. Uh, Harold Lipsius, uh, uh, you know, he began, uh, he was a lawyer and he had a vision and he he had, uh, I think, Dwayne Eddy and uh, Jesse Belwin in the late 50s, he, you know, R&B and rock and roll artists uh, under his umbrella uh, with Jamie Records and then Jamie Guyton. And then uh, I think um, Swan Records under Bernie Binnick had uh, Freddie Cannon and some of the other people. But they were mastered in, you know, those rec- those artists, yeah. their recordings, their productions. The Cameo Parkway was different in the respect that they had, you know, their own facility and they uh, recorded here. And, uh, uh, yeah, you won't see that again. And I think uh, that's the swan that uh, jumped on the Beatle bandwagon. It was, yeah. 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 And they say that, uh, that that enabled them to prosper for another four or five years because... Uh, they got the rights to uh, what was it? She she, she loves, loves you. you yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, ironically, uh, Bernie Lowe and Cameo had an opportunity to to release those uh, Beatles songs in the uh, early '60s, but they thought that they were a fad and they wouldn't last. So they turned their their head in another direction, and uh, that proved their undoing to some extent. Um, by the mid '60s, the Beatles had affected everything, so the music changed, and then uh, the rhythm and blues movement started to bubble under here in Philly, and that gave way to the sound of Philadelphia, the era of uh, Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff, Tom Bell, and Linda Creed, with uh, the Intruders and the Soul Survivors, Eddie Holman, Barbara Mason, uh, the Delphonics, and then the Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, the Stylistics the OJs, the Tramps, and then they attracted, of course, uh, uh, the Spinners, who were uh, from Detroit. They recorded here, as did the OJs. The OJs were from Canton, Ohio, and they were not a Philly group. Mm. And uh, it was a tremendous era. Philadelphia International Records really uh, supplanted Motown. Uh, right. Motown. What Motown was to the music industry and the music culture in the 60s, Philadelphia International Records was in the 1970s. 
And that continued through the 80s, but to a lesser degree. And then you had the, uh, you know, the change in music uh, uh, with the uh, advent of hip-hop and uh, neo-soul and urban soul. And you know, music constantly evolves, as you well know, so there have been changes. But the heyday of the sound of Philadelphia was probably from 1970-71 to the early 80s. Well, in addition to the British invasion coming along and changing the course of music, certainly when Bandstand moved from Philadelphia to Los Angeles, I mean, that dealt a big blow to Cameo Parkway and Philly artists in general. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it really, it, uh, a combination. You know, the, the British invasion, the departure of Bandstand, you know, and as you got into the 60s, you know, you got to remember, too, the 50s were a very... Um, you know, it was stable. Right. If you look at the if you look at the the sixties, there was there was civil unrest, there was war, there was economic uncertainty, there was uh, you know the life was different. There was restlessness. So uh, the the uh, simplified lyrics with uh, the fundamental backbeat and uh, tales of uh, of, uh, of, of, of of love and and uh, cars and and things of that nature, that uh, people's interest uh, changed. You know, they they didn't want to hear that anymore. They they wanted uh, to uh, hear music that was more commensurate with what was going on. And uh, a lot of the the, the 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 soulful music in the '60s, particularly the Sound of Philadelphia, they offered kind of a relief, a joy, a, a, a solace, an inspiration. You know, uh, Barbara Mason was probably they say the 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 first lady of soul with yes i'm ready uh which was uh, a song they say that signaled the coming of age of the sound of philadelphia so um the, the times have a lot to do with uh, the kind of music that appeals to people in my opinion but yeah um the pop the rock and rhythm and blues era that we knew in the 50s the do up era was definitely affected by uh uh, Dick Clark moving to California, Cameo Parkway uh, declining, and uh, all of the English groups coming here and getting the majority of playtime on the airwaves. You know, it was very, very difficult for uh, the, the American artists to, uh, to get their records played, you know, starting yeah. in 63, 64. Well, it's the ever-changing nature of pop music. I mean, look what happened to Motown. Eventually they went on the uh, decline. You know, four or no, five years earlier. I think when they left Detroit and moved to L.A., I think they were uh, they were no longer the same uh, powerhouse that yep. they were. You know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. listen, nothing lasts forever. They they came on what in nineteen sixty three, sixty four. They had a good seven year run. They had the uh, you know uh, a great uh, a great house band, uh, the Funk Brothers, and they had the Four Tops, and they had the Temptations, and Diana Ross and the Supremes, and uh, uh, Tammy Terrell, who was from Philadelphia, by the way, <laughs> uh, Marvin Gaye. I mean, they had they had a tremendous roster of uh, of people. Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. Uh, uh, it, it was it was incredible, you know. But how long can it last? Right. But uh, definitely, uh, it's it's not uh, it's not inaccurate to say that Philadelphia uh, really became the mecca in the 1970s. And Motown had relinquished that uh, that position, and you know all the groups, uh, you know Lou Rawls came here uh, to uh, record with Philly International, the Jacksons, um, the Jones Girls from Chicago. Uh, um, there were a lot of a lot of groups that that came from uh, other parts of the country to uh, to perform here, you know, and uh, they did so because. Philadelphia really was where it's at, and they had a great house band called MFSB, right? Which was composed of a lot of wonderful musicians, and uh, it's just—it's amazing how many artists came out of Philadelphia. Where would people go if they want to uh, get the book and read up on? Well, Amazon, I think, would be the best place to do it. Right. Uh, There's a there's also a website called Oldies dot com. It's it's owned by Jerry Green who is a New Yorker, and he had the group The Mystics in the early 1960s, Hushabye. 
he had lost night records and then he recorded uh the soul survivors here in philly you know with you know he was on his label gamble and huff produced it for him on on his label uh they did uh expressway to your heart and uh explosion of my soul and impossible mission those were all done at jerry green's label uh he owns oldies.com and it's a great site for anybody that's looking for uh, DVDs of old movies or CDs of classic records or books on movies, TV, or music. So they carry the book. They carry all my TV books. Yeah, as I as I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, you've written extensively. I mean, Wagon Train, uh, Payton yeah, Plays. Yeah, we, we did eight. Yeah, we did Route 66, Naked City, Wagon Train, Adventures in Paradise, uh, Payton Place, uh, The Invaders. Right. Uh, Streets of San Francisco, both of those, those two were both Quinn Martin TV series. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, the Invaders with Roy Thinnes, and uh, Streets of San Francisco with Michael uh, Michael Douglas and Carl Malden, and then Quincy. I I, I worked on Quincy, so uh, that was a, a natural for me to do that book because I, had, you know, I had access to a lot of the people on the show. And uh, those books are uh, on Amazon as well. And I have a site too that. Uh, carries all the books. It's called Classic TV Series Books dot com. All right. And I, I'll tell you what, I'm I'm jealous of you because you were able to get an interview with George Maharis. Good Lord, I tried and tried to get George? him Yeah, when the um Well he's an old friend. I know George for years. So. When the uh when the Shout Factory box set came out uh-huh. uh he was doing some press and I said, Oh put me in there and uh, I just missed him for whatever. There was like a small window of opportunity. He really doesn't, from what I understand, he doesn't really like to do a bunch of those well, things. Well, he's kind of reclusive. You know, both he and Marty are older now, you yeah. know, and uh, they, 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 they're they retired from the business. And, uh, right. I think George uh, paints, you know, and Marty uh, keeps a very low profile. And, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're up there in years now. It's... Yeah. 1960 to 64. I do. I will say that the show was never the same after he left. Oh sure. Well, it's just that you know you had great chemistry between uh, George and uh, Martin Milner, and uh, you can't really oh, yeah, you yeah. can't duplicate that with another actor. But no, it, I will say. I mean, he did a great job. Um, I forget the actor's name. I know the character's Link Case. Glenn Corbett. Glenn Corbett. That's his name. And I, as you can tell, I haven't really watched those those episodes all that much. But uh, right. you know, he did he did well for for what he was given. It's, the same thing existed on the streets of San Francisco when Michael left the show, at the beginning of the fifth year, and they brought in Richard Hatch. Uh, you know, he didn't have any time. Uh, he hit the ground running. You know, yeah. and uh, uh, there was such a great rapport between uh, Michael and Carl Walden, and. Uh, um, Michael told me this himself, you know, he said, you know, we, we were, uh, we had love for each other. And he, you know, he, uh, I think because he, uh, Kirk, Kirk Douglas and Carl Malden had been friends and had worked together. He looked uh, on Michael as a son. Carl Malden didn't have any sons. He had two daughters and he looked on Michael like the son he never had. Wow. So when he left uh, to go into feature films, uh, you know, he was not going to embrace the next actor coming in. The way he did Michael, right? As you say, you can't duplicate uh, the original casting most of the time. Yeah. So yeah, that was another series that uh, was an example of that you know it didn't it didn't it was okay, but it's it didn't quite work the same way. Yeah. Anytime someone that's so vital to a show leaves, it's never the same. Yeah. Well, I well, anyway. we, we got off on a big tangent here, but uh, I <laughs> I have. Well, that's okay. It's all related: music, movies, no, it TV. Is. Sure. Pop it's all culture. entertainment. All right, James. All right, thanks again for having me. 